I'm joined now by Dr. Jeremiah Uba, Head of Investment Research at Commercial Partners Limited to review some of our top stories in greater detail. Good morning, Dr. Uba. Great to have you, Good morning. Thank on you the show. Me. Fantastic. So I wanted to start with the global market, stock market sell-off. It seemed like Nigeria, the stock markets were in scathe <laughs> because looking at the close of trading on the exchange, it, it was trading up. So is it that we're just seeing a delayed reaction and the, the impact is still going to come? Well, um, the impact was short-lived, honestly, because at the end of the week, the, the global stock market still closed positive, the US closed positive, despite the massive sell-off. We saw mm. prices move as, as low as 2022 levels, and it was basically because of the what I call triple whammy effect. So the job, the job data came pushing the unemployment to 4.3%, which spiked what I call the, the Samsulik rule, the Samsulik indicator for recession, which mm. is a, an indicator that most traders look at. Yeah. That also shut up the... So what's, what's the actual rule? What's that rule? So it's more or less like um, um, a 1.5 times basis implication of the unemployment rate. So okay. as the unemployment spiked to 4.3%, it triggered the Samsulik rule. To, right. And the last time it was triggered was in 2020 during the recession. So it shot up the VIX index, causing a massive sell-off. Yeah. So are we likely to then be seeing a recession in the US? Well, like you said, JP Morgan increased their probability of recession by 38%. But one thing we can see is that the US economy is very resilient. And um, we might see the Fed coming to cut rates very soon. Not forgetting that 75% of the carry trade from Japan were closed out. So even if you had a position that was leveraged in a good economy, because it's becoming expensive for you to have that position, yeah. you need to close it. Right. So that's so also... That, it triggered the sell-off. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of the impact on Nigeria now, um, looking at what is happening with rates, looking at equity markets, how do you um, expect this global market sell-off, perhaps in the dynamic of the current ongoing recapitalization? of Nigerian banks. Do you see any sort of short-term or immediate impact? You know, there's a saying that capital looks for where it's safe, right? Okay. And Nigeria right now is having a problem trying to raise capital because, you know, like their banking sector, they're trying to recapitalize. But um, on the opposite hand, they're also faced with a risk-free premium of almost 20%. So yeah. it is very important to know that if the global hegemons like the U.S. are having problems with volatility, they won't be looking for more risky assets like emerging countries. So meaning that capital flow to emerging companies can actually reduce or even dry up in yeah. the short term. But, but given that we're likely to see an, e uh, an easing off of rate increases in advanced economies like the U.S., do you think that will, despite the risk-free premium of, like you mentioned, 20 percent, do you think that will at least help drive some capital flows oh, into de Nigeria? Definitely. Immediately we see a rate cut. It would even prompt um, um, Nigeria to even try and enter the euro bond market to try and assess funds for a cheaper rate and receive more inflows because it becomes cheaper to raise capital. Mm -hmm. the, the U.S. economy, last projections for holding rates were eight months. The last, that was the last time they held rate for that long. Right now, they have held it for almost 18 months. So mm. it's overdue for an easing. It's definitely overdue for an easing. So let's talk a bit now about just our, our equity markets domestically. Uh, look at banking index. Look at some of the, ma the major indices, indices. What sort of, are you seeing any patterns in sort of, because at, at, in January, we were at a, a stock market performance was significant. I think year to date, we're probably at about 30% or 33%. But what are you seeing in terms of what is driving markets now and investor sentiment? Well, so usually the consumer goods have been performing from year to date right now, but we have been seeing a slowdown from the banking sector, which is not necessarily what we see in the stock market in Nigeria. The banking sector are always the leaders, but mm. this recapitalization has actually taken a toll on them. And you can see they have ramped up advertisements. They are trying to raise funds. and. It is not easy giving the risk-free premium. If you're an investor, why would you want to try and take a risk in the banking sector when you can get a T-bill for mm. 20%? Absolutely. So let's look at another story. Binance recorded a significant net inflow. You know, I was of the opinion at one point that we're coming to the end of the era for cryptocurrency. Wow. <laughs> but you're seeing an unprecedented drive of inflows into alternative assets. Is this partly a reflection of some of the volatility elsewhere? that is then causing the significant inflow. I mean, it's saying $1.2 billion in 24 hours. Yeah. yeah. So this particular inflow is what I call institutional money, right? But gone are the days that Bitcoin is being um, pushed by people on Twitter. The proponents of Bitcoin now are heads of asset management that have 
10 trillion dollars on asset under management like sure. Larry Finn. So these are people that are not only just pushing Bitcoin, they are bringing more use cases. Like Larry Finn wants to open um, a Texas stock exchange to try and tokenize all financial assets. That's mm. implication for Bitcoin That's is Larry massive. Finn is BlackRock, the yes. head of BlackRock. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And we still see Cathie Woods giving her base case prediction for Bitcoin at 650,000 and best case at 3.8 million. So Bitcoin's potential is massive. And mm. what we see during global shocks like this is showing the resilience of the particular cryptocurrency. And we saw Bitcoin drop below a trillion dollar market cap. Right now it's above $1.1 trillion. Mm. And how high do you think that market cap could go if you're saying that most of the investors in Bitcoin now is, we're shifting heavily towards institutional investors, which is more long money investors. My 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 um my prediction is that you know this week gave us one of the best deep buying opportunities. We might never see Bitcoin crash to that level anymore. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And, and deep buying Bitcoin now, I think, is trading what we're in the thirty thousand around sixty thousand around sixty thousand. Yeah. Yes. So and ah. it, it hit. 56,000 during the crash, and we saw the mop up just within a week yeah. to show you so, that. So, I, I guess the question then if you're seeing such huge inflows in such a short space of time, what is then the risk of a major sell off, right? If there's another shock to the system, or if there are some fundamentals elsewhere in capital markets that makes alternative assets away from Bitcoin more, if, you know, what is the sustainability of this sort of institutional money? Yeah, so, you know, now we are in a very dynamic time where, you know, the US election is coming. And two over two third of their candidates already have plans of having Bitcoin strategic reserves. Okay. So if um, 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 Donald Trump or the other candidate wins, they are definitely going to start keeping Bitcoin as a strategic reserve. So if a US hegemony is thinking of keeping Bitcoin like gold, we should see that um, the volatility in Bitcoin will be done when there is no patient capital. Mm -hmm. But if patient money can wait, like banks and countries get into Bitcoin, the volatility will start striking out based on it's a deflationary currency. So the inflation actually reduces it. So it's, there's, there's, there's prospect for this particular asset. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. You know, it's, it's just incredible, the growth of cryptocurrency, the growth of uh, alternative asset classes. And when you see... In the last few years, been, there's been a huge regulatory ons onslaught ar 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 against crypto exchanges. We've yes. seen what happened with FTX and Bankman Fried as well. And we see some of the penalties that were lo le against the, um, levied against the founder of Binance. But what is the, your sense on how developing economies like Nigeria, other countries in Africa will eventually, will they re-embrace the cryptocurrency revolution because the market here seems to have gone quiet in light of some of the concerns around cybersecurity risks <clears throat> that the regulators like the CBN have had. So my, 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 the problem with the emerging markets is that sometimes they're always slow to act. And we have seen some people that have taken the bold step like El Salvador and mm. we saw the impact. And even anytime there is a dip, he's always buying because he has understood the, how the economy works and the fact that there, there needs to be another approach to our currency. Mm. The truth about it is that no currency lasts forever. So even if the dollar hegemony is there and we don't see it living in our lifetime, we understand that the Saudi deal of selling dollars in oil has dropped and mm. we are not having threats like the, um, the BRICS currency, you know? So staying, having a currency and putting, it, uh, uh, putting all your eggs in one basket might not be the necessary thing to mm. do at this stage. So as emerging economies, we see that we are struggling with the dollar. We are trying to repay dollar loans. We are trying to have our dollar make sense in terms of exchange rates with other currencies. Bitcoin presents a new opportunity because this currency is not, um, um, is not going to be triggered by bad government policies. For example, Venezuela has a problem of skyrocketing inflation and skyrocketing and, and, and depreciation of exchange rates. Mm. The, as a Venezuelan, you might not be able to hold value when you are earning good income. You might want to convert it to dollar, but this might be hard based on regulations. Cryptocurrency presents another opportunity for you to store your wealth, mm. and this will trickle down all across all across emerging countries. So the revolution of Bitcoin will come whether the government embraces or not. The truth about it is that the, once the government gets ahead of it mm. and start embracing it and start putting network, they can even bring their own cryptocurrency that would survive Bitcoin. Because 
Whether Bitcoin comes or goes is not the important thing. The important thing is the blockchain technology is here to, to stay. stay. Of course, yeah. Very interesting. Now, from one currency to another, there was a report that Cardoso, under Cardoso's government, the CBN has, uh, his regime, sorry, well, I guess he runs a government in the CBN, that the CBN has sold most dollars under Cardoso. And the, the, we saw the Naira strengthening a bit. Mm -hmm. It, tell me about this, because there's been a lot of volatility again. Then we saw depreciation after the earlier appreciation in the year. And now this reports that the CBN has actually sold the most dollars under the Cardoso government. First of all, is that a sign that they're, they, are, they have the right policies? And secondly, you know, what is the near term outlook for, for the Naira? Well, if they have sold the most dollars and we have not seen the most appreciation, it doesn't really tell them that like what they're doing is hitting the right. Okay, so what does it tell you? If they've sold the most dollars and we haven't seen the most appreciation of the Naira yet, is there something we're missing here? Well, what we are missing is a disconnect from the fundamentals. Okay. The exchange rate is a structural problem. As mm -hmm. long as we don't import, we don't export anything and we import everything, we'll keep on having this problem of exchange rate. Mm -hmm. So we immediately understand these structural problems and fix the structural issues. Most of this CBN increasing interest rates, these are short-term fixed. They're not supposed to be there for a long period of time. Mm. And selling of these auctions could appreciate the Naira significantly, uh, slightly in the short term, but it will, it, will, it, will, it will move back to where it was uh, over time. So we need more problems that fix the structural issues rather than just giving short-term fix. Okay, so I, I guess that means you're not really a fan of the retail Dutch auction system that's been reintroduced. How do you see that impacting dynamics in the short Well, I've been monitoring, short I've been monitoring the, um, um, the, the, the exchange rate and I'm not seeing any real improvement. If as, a, as, a, as an individual, maybe if I wanted to buy something worth $3,000, I was okay, maybe CBN is doing some things to improve the Naira. Would I actually be able to save some money with this improvement? So I've not really seen it go to the level that I would expect and as a Nigerian, I'll be happy about. Okay, great. Thank you so much for sharing your views. We've Thank been you. speaking to Dr. Jeremiah Uba, the head of investment research at Commercial Capital Partners. Thanks for coming on the show.